On behalf of Outreach Aid to the Americas, welcome and thank you for joining us for this two-part conversation about the reality of religious freedom in Cuba. I would like to thank your, our audience for tuning in via Zoom and to those joining us on YouTube. And before we begin our conversation, let us start with a brief, with brief instructions. After our moderate, uh, our after conversation, we will take questions from the Zoom audience. And in order for you to participate in the Q&A, attendees should submit questions through the Q&A feature that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Then this is an event that is bilingual, so English and Spanish and we have interpretation services available. So if you need this service, just please use the interpretation feature that you will also find at the bottom of the screen. And finally, uh, we would like to let you know that the event will be recorded and posted for later viewing on OAA's YouTube channel. So if you are registered for today's event, you will receive an email notification once it is posted on YouTube. And uh, now, without further ado, allow me to introduce our moderator for this session, Dr. Tio Baboon, President and CEO of OAA. Dr. Baboon. Thank you, Mari Carmen, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the introduction and, the, uh, and all the instructions. Uh, uh, this is a very timely uh, webinar. Um, in more ways than one, and I hope you agree as we move forward, uh, the government of Cuba puts a lot of effort into trying to persuade the international community that there is no religious freedom problems in Cuba. There are no religious problems uh, in Cuba. In fact, just days ago, uh, following a presentation by uh, Dr. Shahid, who you will hear from, uh, later today, and I'll make the introduction following some brief comments. Uh, at a meeting of the Human Rights Council uh, at the United Nations, uh, during what is known as the interactive dialogue, where country representatives, uh, country representatives report to the um, uh, to the remarks of a report uh, provided by the. Uh, uh, by the special rapporteurs, the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations responded not to the address uh, of the report, but instead lashed out at those who criticize its human rights record for using freedom of religion or belief, in his words, to attack Cuba and undermine its government, thus minimizing the whole concept uh, and the whole, the rights of a freedom of religion, the entire Article 18 of the, um, uh, uh, of, um, of the Articles on Human Rights uh, by simply uh, brushing it off as an attack against uh, uh, the Cuban government itself and calling all those basically who defended freedom of religion counter-revolutionaries a true travesty, uh, but an expected uh, attack against uh, advocates for freedom of religion. But we saw in the 2020 uh, report of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom uh, uh, that found that religious freedom conditions in Cuba had worsened in 2019, and it was recommended by the U.S. Commission uh, that the State Department placed Cuba in what is called a special watch list for countries that don't merit the strongest placement. Uh, and that includes countries such as China and North Korea, uh, whose violations of religious freedoms are very serious, as we know, as you all know, and likely getting worse uh, all, all the time. Uh, before the commission began using the special watch list category, which was created in 2016, uh, the, uh, the commission would place Cuba in what is called its tier two list of countries whose governments perpetrated or tolerated serious violations to religious freedom alongside countries such as Afghanistan 
Egypt, Iraq, and Turkey. But in December of this past year, at the end of the year, the State Department followed the Commission's recommendations and for the first time placed Cuba on the special watch list. Uh, uh, as expected in the annual report of the U.S. Department of State uh, International Religious Freedom, which will again be released uh, in May of this year, coming year, uh, it was uh, reported that there were no uh, significant, no improvements over the past year, as we anticipate that this report will also uh, report uh, a list of violations that have taken place. Uh, and uh, it is due, in fact, to the scrutiny and the pressure from those who are paying attention uh, to human rights issues in Cuba that this report, uh, that the State Department and others have taken notice of the travesty and the violations of the Cuban government uh, on uh, freedom of religion and belief. Cuba, the government is obviously feeling the pressure now um, from both outside, as we just mentioned, as we saw its manifestation at the United Nations recently in Geneva, and more recently uh, also inside where we have seen some movements uh, begin, uh, a newly involved uh, movement of Cuban Catholics in uh, I'm making reference to, and in many cases led by priests, who have become active and outspoken in holding the island leaders accountable for their part in the terrible present crisis that the uh, Cuban people are experiencing right now. Various priests, as some of you know, are uh, uh, chancing it by participating with other uh, Cuban Catholics, uh, raising their voice through open letters, homilies, Facebook posts, and other initiatives uh, now fully uh, confronting and advocating for freedom of religion and confronting the Cuban government on its violation on freedom of religion. This is new. This is new, and perhaps some of you haven't heard about this movement that's taken place in Cuba. Uh, uh, you'll hear more about it. Perhaps later this year we'll have a webinar just dedicated to that, uh, to that movement and have some of the priests uh, attend a webinar so that they can explain their position. Some are very aggressive and are asking for a dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Cuban government on this, on this issue that they find uh, of, tremendous, uh, of tremendous interest. But enough of, of my background, I, I, like to, uh, I like to introduce you to our, uh, uh, to our main speaker. This is a black tie gala event for Outreach Aid to the Americas. Uh, we have the privilege of uh, being joined by Dr. Ahmed Shahid uh, from Europe right now. It's probably near his bedtime, uh, but so we really appreciate him being here. If you've never heard from Dr. Shahid, you are in for a treat. Uh, Dr. Shahid, assumes his mandate as Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief in November uh, of 2016. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief is an independent expert appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council, and their mandate is, uh, is to be the holder that has been invited to identify existing and emerging obstacles to the enjoyment of the right of freedom of religion or belief and, pre and present recommendations on ways and means to overcome these uh, this obstacles. Prior to his appointment as UN uh, envoy uh, with, the, uh, with the rank of Assistant Secretary General, he was a Maldivian, pol uh, Maldivian politician and human rights defender he served as, as the Maldivian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and previous to that, he had served as Minister of Foreign Affairs for two years uh, in, that, in that country. Dr. Shahid is Deputy uh, Director of the Essex uh, Human Rights Center um, uh, in England. He was first a Special Rapporteur of the Human Rights Council 
on the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, since the termination of the previous Commission on Human Rights Mandate in 2002. Uh, uh, he was also attacked by the Iranian government uh, and falsely accused of being a member of the CIA, which is the typical attack that we hear from both uh, countries such as that and countries like Cuba, for example. Uh, um, I will, uh, um, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I think it, it, it is a, it's my mandate to make sure that you are aware of what Dr. Shahid has done uh, regarding Cuba um, in the past uh, four or five years. Dr. Shahid uh, is special to us uh, Cubans. I was born in Cuba and to those that are advocating for freedom of religion in Cuba. In 2019, uh, he wrote a report and presented a report on current laws in Cuba. Uh, the, the report stated that current laws in Cuba allow the government to prohibit and penalize a broad range of protected uh, religious practices. For years, uh, the United Nations Human Rights uh, uh, accountability mechanisms routinely have failed to flag widespread systematic and well-documented repressions of churches, congregations, religious leaders, and worshipers by the Cuban government. Dr. Shahid previously served five years as the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Iran. He now is broadening his office focus to Cuba for the first time as we very much appreciate that. A, a highly respected academic and senior government official, he has a well-earned reputation as a tough, fair-minded advocate for individuals who demand the freedom to practice their religion of their choice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you uh, uh, Dr. Shahid, uh, Ahmed Shahid, uh, Dr. Shahid, uh, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Tio Bevan. Um, good morning, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure uh, to join you today to talk about the situation in Cuba with regard to freedom of religion or belief. I'm really grateful to our Project America uh, for its collaboration with my mandate. It has enabled me to be more perceptive and perhaps more incisive in my scrutiny of the Cuban situation and look forward to this collaboration moving forward. Now, of course, um, before I talk about the situation in Cuba, I want to preface this with some general comments about um, the frame this within the context of the international understanding of the right to freedom of the general belief and the most typical types of violations of which Cuba, of course, forms a part. I also highlight the importance of this meeting at this time. We are in a very important year. Um, later this year, we'll mark the 40th anniversary of what is called the 1981 UN Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and of Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief. Now, this is the most detailed international consensus document on what rights are protected under freedom of religion or belief, and also makes the important connection with the wider human rights framework and the UN Charter itself, um, saying that discrimination amounts to a disavowal of the uh, UN Charter principle. So therefore, there is an, it highlights the importance of protecting religious freedom for everybody. It's also evident that from the lessons of the past century, it was the main one was that democracies are the best forms of government to protect every, everybody's rights. And unless there was a democracy, we would face very serious rights violations. And of course, open societies upon which democracies rest cannot be achieved without respect for freedom of religion or belief, because the full rights is, is thus freedom of thought, conscience, and religion or belief. So if states are not willing to respect the freedom of thought from, from, from where the idea of individual agency begins, then we wouldn't have a chance of freedom of opinion or expression or association or assembly or any of the other rights that we want to claim for ourselves. So it's such a fun, fundamental and foundational right. At the same time, this right also depends on a range of other rights for its full enjoyment. For example, 
uh, you know, my freedom of expression, freedom of uh, religion or belief will require me to be able to express my uh, religious beliefs in some, in, in always in peaceful fa fashion, but also to associate with those who share my worldview, to assemble for worship or other the ceremonies. So it is, there is a collective dimension to this. So let me briefly begin by stating the broad nature of this right. The right has two broad limbs. One is the forum internum, the right to believe whatever one wants to believe. And that's totally inviolable. There, there can be no there can be no restriction, no qualification upon that right whatsoever. Of course, some states struggle with this idea, but that's when, when they become the really worst of the worst in terms of rights violations. That's one part, the freedom, the internal autonomy of the individual, the right to believe whatever one wants to believe. And also, of course, the, the right of conscience, the one's idea, innate idea of what is right and wrong. That's entirely up to the individual without any interference by any actor to, to hold those views. The second part, of course, is the public manifestation of, of, that, of, of those beliefs. And of course, um, this can be done in, you know, in a variety of ways. Um, the, the rights framework lists four items, uh, uh, worship, observance, teaching and practice, but that's non-exhaustive. It can be done in many other ways, so long as they are peaceful, but broadly signifies what a, what a wide range of activities are covered within the right to manifest one's religion or belief. And also, of course, one has to bear in mind that as a very broad right, this right includes both religious and non-religious beliefs, both traditional religions and non-traditional religions. So in other words, a very, very, very broad uh, uh, set of protections. And of course, the idea that this right belongs to the individual inherently, although there's a collective dimension to it, is an individual right. And one is free to self-define one's religious orientation in whatever way that one wants, so long as it is peaceful. However, the manifestation of this right is not unlimited. It can be limited on two sets of, two groups of uh, um, you know, concerns. One are public interests, and these are only public safety, public health, public morals, and public order. Nothing else, just these four public interests. And then of course, rights of others. So I cannot use my religious freedom, for example, to harm the rights of other people. That's, that's for, no, no right can be exercised in that fashion. So even for this right, there's a limitation. But the other public interests, they have to be very, very carefully you know, understood. There is no national security here. It's public safety. Public safety links directly to, the, to, the, to people and their property. So an abstract idea of national security cannot be invoked to restrict this, this freedom. Public order, again, has a very, very high threshold. It's actually actual disruption of the public order that is at play here. And of course, after all these things, the state must ensure it follows with the a very strict limitations regime. That is, measures taken must be legitimate. It must fall into one of these five grounds I mentioned. It must be legal as well. In other words, clearly prescribed in a legitimate law, a law passed by a parliament through a democratic process, which is clear enough for people to know when that uh, law ha boundary has been breached. The third is um, necessity. It must correspond to a pressing social need. There must be a real dire need to have that right restricted. During the pandemic, of course, you've seen pressing social need to impose certain restrictions for a certain time frame in certain areas. Then, of course, that is the idea of proportionality. In other words, just because there is a pressing social need doesn't mean you can use a sledgehammer to crack a nut as it were. It has to be a proportional measure. So whatever is the present social need, the, the, the restriction imposed by the state must be tailored to meet that pressing need, to meet the objective. But in no case can that, uh, can that measure destroy the right entirely. In other words, if there was a less restrictive measure, that's the permissible one, not, not something more restrictive. And of course, ultimately, there should be no discrimination, either in intent or in effect. Now, that is the regime. Of course, the ICCPR lists one more item. That's, of course, non-coercion. Applies to, uh, you know, to, to everybody. And one specific element of non-coercion, that is the parental liberty to raise children in religious or moral conviction of, of their own. Of course, until the children attain their own awareness uh, and, and maturity about themselves. So that's the, right, uh, the rights fr uh, fr uh, fr uh, fr uh, framework. And of course, the most frequent violations come in the application of the limitations regime. Uh, and of course, the uh, two ways of doing this, one is directly restrict the right to express one's religious freedom through a variety of means or restricting other rights. So we see in many countries obsessed with security, they may restrict freedom of movement. This would immediately hinder 
the ability of people to assemble in a particular place or to travel, uh, travel to other countries or the part of pilgrimage is an important part for many religious uh, organizations. Of course, the, the pandemic has seen in every country more restrictions on religious practice than before. Of course, in many countries, these have been proportionate, therefore legitimate, because they're temporary as well and, and, and address a public health concern. But in many countries, governments have, have used the pandemic, the cover of the pandemic, to clamp down on civic space and to, and to restrict our space uh, entirely. And of course, target groups that they have, in any case, been targeting. And typically, governments target the minorities uh, and dissenters uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this fashion. So wherever Cuba was last year, meaning 2019, as with other countries, in a much worse situation this year. And therefore, it's very important that we are meeting um, this spring to discuss you know, how things, where things stand now and what we can do working with the UN and other international organizations to push things forward in Cuba because it's such a restrictive space. Now, I want to highlight that international law says nothing about the nature of the state religion relationship. In other words, a state is free to have any kind of interaction with religion. And this varies from a state that are close, so closely entangled with religion that they, they become theocratic states, like Iran is an example. Iran, Saudi Arabia would fill this model. To those who have a hostile attitude towards religion altogether, in other words, totally almost atheistic in, in their approach towards, uh, towards religion. And of course, they try to impose that on, on, on states. So there are about 10 states in the world who fit this hostile towards religion category. And uh, along with China and Vietnam, uh, Cuba, uh, is in that group of states which take a hostile attitude towards religion or state. And of course, this informs the uh, state policy. The requirement, of course, is that whatever the relationship state may have with religion, there's an obligation. And that is that the state must, the, 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 the state must be an impartial guarantor of everybody's, uh, everybody's religion uh, or belief. In, life. in other words, regardless of the state's uh, attitude towards religion, it must be able to guarantee everybody's rights impartially, whether one is religious, non-religious, there should be no discrimination, or belongs to a majority religion or a minority one. So that is a legal framework that is out there. The other thing to remember, of course, is that there's such a, such a close interaction with other, other rights as well. To respect Article 18 rights, the state must, must ensure it respects non-discrimination. You cannot discriminate on, uh, against anyone on many grounds, and one of those grounds is religion. The other, of course, is to recognize that men and women have equal rights. They got all the rights in the rights framework. This applies to uh, this right as well. Equality before the law. In many countries, there's a hierarchy of, of citizens based, based upon states' understanding of what is the more important for, for them. That's, again, wrong. Respect privacy. Uh, this right can be exercised either in public or in, uh, 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 alone, uh, public or private, alone with other people. So respect privacy is important. In the digital world, we find increasingly states using means to pry into people's inner thoughts, to, in to violate their privacy, and then to p penalize people on the basis of what they can divine out of these uh, interventions. So that is the, 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 the framework here. Yeah. Now, interestingly, if you look at the, the, you know, the broad range of patterns uh, of state and relationships, there are three broad categories. One is um, those states where there is a close entanglement with religion. They can have an established religion or a favored religion or favored religions. And there are about 40 states in the world that fall in this category, that they have an established religion or favored religions. And then of course, then there are those states, like I said, Cuba, uh, Vietnam, China, um, you can include some of the uh, former Soviet um, uh, Central Asian republics. They also have a hostile attitude towards religion. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, in the middle, those who have a neutral position towards religion, neither establishment, no hostility. And it's in this middle range where we find that most uh, respect for religious freedom. Now, one of the tools I use is sending out communications to governments when I find a rights violation. Uh, there's an allegation letter, as I've done in the case of Cuba, or an urgent appeal when there's an imminent uh, rights violation that is, that is about to happen. So if I look at the, my database, the, um, you know, the countries which have reached the highest amount of communications are those which have a very strong religious association or those who have hostile attitude towards, towards religion. So these, these polar opposites actually have a lot more in common than at first, at, at appears at first blush. And it's largely because in both cases, there is an overwhelming or overriding state ideology that is used to control the population. And the state's orientation, disposition, is to ensure that nobody can challenge that state ideology, whether it is based on, say, a religious ideology 
or an unreligious one. But the idea is to control the population. And this is because religious freedom has been proven to be a great promoter of pluralism. If you look at the Latin American region itself in the 80s, in the way dictatorships fell, there was a vital role played by the, by the church in ensuring that there remained a place for assembly, for association, for expression, for solidarity, for mobilization, and, and, for, and for reaching out to other people. So this is one reason why states try to control religion, because they fear that if they allowed this freedom to, to flourish, there would be pluralism, with, uh, diversity, and of course, there would be democracy. This, this, that, that is anathema to, to a dictator. So that's why I think there's such a, such a hostility towards religion uh, in, um, I, 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 in, in Cuba. Now, of course, uh, if I may turn to the, uh, of course, uh, in, in, in both the situations, whether it is a state attachment to religion or state hostility to religion, certain things happen. That is, states put impediments in the way of various religious uh, rights. So for example, an important thing is being able to register as an organization. So in states where there is state religion, there is an, there's an officially recognized version of religion. They can be registered in the way the state wants, the state wants them, but other minority religions cannot find registration easily. Either they have very high requirements for registration, such as collecting signatures of a very large number of uh, adherents, or including their personal details in the application, or requiring that they have a presence, very high, uh, high number across a range of uh, states' provinces, which make it almost impossible for many of the minority faiths to organize themselves. As a consequence, they don't have legal personality status, which means they cannot own property, such as for a house of worship, or for a school, or, or for teaching, or for carrying out other functions, other humanitarian functions that these organizations actually uh, you know, uh, engage in. So it can have a, quite a lethal impact on the ability of these groups to exist. In other words, state tries to suppress their total existence. This happens also in the other, at the other extreme, where, or in the atheistic or hostile states, where again, states will impose restrictions on religious organizations. Um, it will not allow people to register unless it met very high requirements. And of course, beyond the initial requirements, there can be repeated harassment or reporting obligations, constant, constant reporting of data, constant updating of its membership, in, in, in ways make it so difficult to operate. And once registered, they might also say, you can only operate in this locality. For example, you may have a registered address for this church. That's the only place where you can operate. In other words, any teaching, any preaching should happen in this premise and possibly at given times. So state tries to control registration. And through that, they might also try to control the appointment of the functionaries of these associations. So uh, whatever the church or the other organization may, may want to have there as their leader, the state may have their own ideas and say, no, this is your leader. In fact, they might set up their own middle organizations and have leaders in, in this organization to suppress, suppress their independent ones. And of course, uh, very often, faith communities are global. They have, they have coordinates across borders and they do depend on their support. And very often you need their uh, presence as well. And there, there's frequently visa denials for say, a priest or an imam or a rabbi who might want to travel from, from across, across, across the border. So that's again another way of exercising control. And this control can extend also to the duration of sermons, the language of sermons, the timing of sermons, and those who can attend those sermons. In many countries, they may put an age limit or a gender limit on who can, who can um, at, attend this, this function. So this is just freedom as an individual right, uh, exercise in communion, uh, doesn't uh, act, uh, doesn't um, you know, uh, uh, happen for these communities at all. That's a serious concern. And of course, beyond that, there are other measures to securitize these organizations, which is to present these new groups as a security threat. And this can come in the form of a threat to national unity, threat to national harmony, threat to societal unity or solidarity. All the grounds that are, none of these grounds are justifiable on international human rights though, because they're not about public order, public safety, public, public morals, but all concern the state has that it may lose its control over society. So these are the top types of restrictions that states impose when they have, when they are either a state with an attachment to religion, and Iran is a good example here, like I said, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, Pakistan is also a good example here. They, uh, in all these cases, there's suppression of minority religious uh, faiths. There are apostasy laws, there are blasphemy laws, all, all those designed to suppress expressions of views that are not consistent with the established orthodoxy. At the other end, the Vietnams, the Chinas, uh, Uzbekistans and elsewhere, 
there is that that uh, uh, you know a disposition to control expression that again there's no space for this freedom and along with that comes a very emaciated space for other civil rights no freedom of expression no assembly no association and therefore pluralism doesn't exist and therefore democracy is in, is either non-existent or in in great uh, great, great danger now in turning to cuba you find that all of these elements i mentioned are, are, are you know are, are, are quite, quite visible there is the whole marks of hostile environment towards religion is quite evident in what we see uh, in the case uh, of cuba and of course here here the underlying um, um, disposition is to protect what can be called the ideals and morals and norms of the revolution and of course that is again a, a set of ideas that are not inclusive and of, of course imposed on those who may have you know uh, other views uh, from the established inst institutions and because of the underlying subtext we've seen that even attempts to reform um, the country's legal framework have not been that successful of course there have been in recently some positive changes toward uh, to, to, uh, to some laws and of course there was expectation that this would also include positive change towards religious freedom unfortunately i think we are in a situation where the draft where the phrasing of the of the law actually um uh, pr pronounces the hostile attitude towards religion and of course fails to protect recognize the important protections that religious freedom requires uh, for, for adherence of religions and, and different different beliefs so this in, in a way the wording is weaker and possibly more dangerous than the wording that was in the previous constitution and because of this um the government's actions approach towards religion results in a number of illegitimate incursions into the rights of, of, of belief communities. Like I mentioned, the registration requirements are quite, uh, are, are, are quite uh, demanding, and there is scrutiny by the Service for Religious Affairs and Justice Ministry. Again, restricting the ability uh, of uh, organizations to, to register. Many have had their bids rejected, and, and, and of course, there's no accountability for this person, and, and neither is there any transparency uh, for this. So in other words, a quite a flagrant violation of the right to association, and of course, through that link to, link to the right to freedom of uh, religion or, 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 or belief. And then, of course, um, I've received reports that those who seek exercise um, uh, this right, including religious leaders, face a whole range of victimization, including campaigns of intimidation and vilification against them, uh, harassment, surveillance, and of course, the, 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 the unwelcome what of state security of, of officials towards them and their, and, and, their, and their congregations and family members, and of course, in many cases, resulting in detention, which is arbitrary, and of course, travel bans and seizure of their property or even destruction of their property, including houses of worship. Whilst this brazen targeting of communities has increased, uh, according to my uh, data, over well, the past couple of years, as, as by some 22% or more in terms of the number of incidents reported and harassment faced by these, uh, by, by these individuals. And I think at meetings like this and even elsewhere, we must send a very clear message that such violations of rights will not be tolerated with, with impunity. There would be accountability for this. And I think linking up with the global community is a good way of ensuring that we can pursue, pursue this. I have been uh, engaging with, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with outreach aid for America as well as solidarity worldwide uh, to look at uh, what's happening in the country and to engage the global community on, on issues there. I've issued communications from my mandate to Cuba. I've, I've requested a visit uh, uh, to, uh, to go to, uh, to the country, but you know, Cuba seems uh, hesitant to engage with issues raised by mandate or in fact even invite me uh, um, to come there. Of course, I cannot come to a country on a, a full visit unless there was an official invitation for me to visit there. Uh, at which point there'll be program arranged and I can meet government officials as well as uh, uh, individual, individuals uh, privately. And that's the best uh, uh, scenario for a person like me, my capacity to really monitor what, what's going on. But in the absence of this, I have been able to receive credible reports from multiple sources, from the defenders about the plights you face. And, and once that information is brought to me and to my colleagues in the reporter system, we can send communications out or in other ways highlight these concerns. And this, of course, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Tio, at the start, this kind of exposure of, of our, our government's behavior at the council is, is quite startling response from them. And of course, while the response may be aggressive, it also betrays our vulnerability. The more aggressive a state is in responding to the allegations, which are factually based, 
the more vulnerable they actually are in terms of the, the price they pay. So I think there's a huge normative uh, price, reputational price the Cuban government will, will pay for its professed you know, um, desire to reform that when, these, when we call out these violations. So I look forward to engaging uh, with you, human rights defenders in Cuba and outside Cuba, working for Cuba, to raise concerns, uh, awareness about these issues, highlight these cases, and of course, see if we can uh, strengthen protections and for, for defenders in the country and of course outside the country who are working to advance freedom, freedom for all. Now, I will end here and be very happy to uh, receive any questions and feedback from any of you, but I want to reiterate that in my mandate, I have increased uh, my scrutiny on Cuba in recent uh, months and years, and I've got uh, another year and a half to go, and I look forward to increasing uh, my, my if you like, focus on Cuba in the time to come. I look forward to therefore collaborating with you, Office of Aid of America, and of course others in this, in this webinar, in getting information out of the country, and of course supporting those in the country, and of course putting pressure on the government to, uh, to relent and behave better. Thank you. Your microphone, it's muted, Dr. Babam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahid, for that commitment that you just articulated. I kept my microphone down because, as you know, most of us are working out of uh, remote areas and the bells ring and dogs bark and all that. So <laughs> uh, we are, um, uh, you know, spe uh, specific to your presentation. Uh, your visit to Cuba is a very important it's very important to uh, all of us who are advocates for freedom of religion and, and the human rights defenders and anything that uh, can be done to assist you in that goal uh, uh, would be, uh, uh, we would appreciate hearing from. We can, um, not us only as uh, OAA, but certainly uh, many of those who are in attendance here today that that uh, that can be uh, that can provide uh, some assistance uh, in whatever way uh, can be done. Um, uh, we would really appreciate hearing uh, because we realized how important that event would be. In addition, you mentioned you mentioned some uh, some of, uh, some violations of rights uh, that should not be tolerated, and uh, it's. Uh, just wanted to point out in the case of Cuba that just last week, um, a group of um, uh, that we call an alliance of evangelical uh, churches, which are independent and represent about uh, approximately 2 million uh, persons in Cuba. Remember, Cuba only has a population of 11 million people. Uh, uh, published a common uh, paper, a common document and specifically, they mentioned uh, four of these violations that should not be tolerated. Uh, one is uh, the, uh, the Cuban government is not allowing them to openly receive and distribute humanitarian assistance to the poor and to others in the country. Uh, another one is a, um, uh, a restriction on how they can um, project and help the elderly in the country uh, through uh, different means that the government is not providing uh, uh, both elderly and children uh, that need uh, special protection, particularly uh, children without parents. Uh, that, uh, uh, as you know, in Cuba, there are basically no, none of these facilities, and yet uh, the churches are attempting to uh, to provide assistance and they need a free hand to be able to exert uh, their social uh, responsibility uh, of providing assistance to, uh, to the population. And, uh, and lastly, uh, once again, uh, they mention the restrictions that exist on being able to communicate openly with the people, uh, with the people uh, through their uh, uh, to provide uh, spiritual uh, uh, assistance, uh, particularly uh, to people in a more a larger uh, media uh, a way, they feel they're being censored. Uh, there are there's no uh, there are no means for them to be able to use the radio, television, or otherwise uh, different ways. And now the government is 
um, is not very happy with social media, uh, which they're starting to use, and so starting to provide some controls in those areas. Um, and so thank you for, for reminding us of that, and we, you know, we'll continue as an organization, certainly, to uh, bring attention uh, uh, to, those, uh, to, those, uh, to those issues. Uh, before we take questions, uh, you know, we had on the schedule uh, Dan Nadell. Uh, and uh, Dan, uh, uh, Mr. Danell, unfortunately, was detained and could not join us today. He sends his apologies. Uh, but nonetheless, I feel that I need to tell you a little bit about Dan Nadell and his office. He is the director of the Office of International Religious Freedom uh, in Washington. Um, and uh, very actively um, involved in, in um, reports that are published by uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of State, both on human rights and, um, and on uh, freedom of religion. The human rights report, uh, I believe, will be published in a couple of weeks, and the freedom of religion report is due to be published in, in May. Uh, they are great sources of research and, and, and information, uh, they they take very careful uh, approach. Uh, the State Department does using the embassies to collect information, to do interviews, and to provide uh, reports on on actually what's happening in 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 every country in the world. Uh, sometimes we don't, you know, particularly we don't love some things that we that we read, but you know it is what it is, and they try to be. Uh, factual in everything that they do. Before they, before that, uh, uh, Mr. Nadell was uh, in the Office of European Affairs at the Bureau of Democracy and Human Rights and Labor, and before that, a special assistance to the U.S. Attorney. He's a, a great professional, and I'm selling him high because we're going to have him back. Uh, you know, we're we're not going to go to sleep. On, on this very, very important issue, which is being ignored by a number of, uh, uh, of uh, organizations. As you know, you know, it's no secret that there's been uh, many uh, reports and white papers presented, uh, particularly to the new administration in the United States, uh, recommending uh, changes uh, and or uh, ideas on how they may be able to engage with the Cuban government uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, in none of those reports, the uh, uh, freedom of religion and belief or the violations of freedom of religion and belief are mentioned and it's a travesty, we believe. We're not at ground zero here, um, but certainly uh, we feel that that the message is not getting through uh, everybody. And they need to understand that violations on the rights of uh, freedom of religion are violations of human rights. And, uh, and many of the, uh, of the human rights issues uh, 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 can be seen. If you violate uh, Article 18, uh, you're violating almost every other right and freedom uh, that, uh, uh, that those people are uh, in those countries. Having said that, I will. I, I think what I should do is, uh, Mari Carmen and uh, Sumaya. I am going to yield the time. The rest of the time, let's let's open it up to questions. Let's have Dr. Shahid have an opportunity to respond to a number of uh, questions, uh, uh, because I think that's where there's a there's a lot of value in in, in doing that. So I'm going to uh, be quiet now. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Babin, for your excellent comments. And, and of course, thank you, Dr. Shahid, for your incredible, insightful presentation, which provided us with this great overview and highlighted the importance of freedom of religion for the development, democracy, and human rights in Cuba. Now we're getting into the questions and answers time. We have received a few questions that we'd like to pass for Dr. Shahid's consideration for his answers. One, it says, in countries like Cuba, the faith community is viewed as one of the only functioning spheres for civil society. 
from your perspective, are there risks in promoting the role of churches as civil society organizations that have a role in promoting democracy and improved governance? Does your office incorporate civil society themes in promoting the, the role of faith community in authoritarian countries? Thank you, very good question. The second part of the answer is yes. Uh, the, there is a need to promote the civic space for all actors and, and often in countries where there is a reluctance to engage directly with Article 18, so directly with this freedom, uh, there are other entry points. These entry points are about right to association, assembly, and organization, and so on and so forth. Um, well, in regard to um, supporting the role of faith-based actors, there are, there are, of course, you know, two sides to this. One, of course, is you couldn't have a democracy or pluralism without the space for religious freedom. And as, as a questioner, you know, mentioned, in many countries, the church or faith-based organizations remain the only space in which people can organize. So that's the kind of a kind of a automatic civic space that, that is there. Now, you know, uh, what my what I do is in all contexts apply the human rights framework. So even if it is the case of a community organized around religion, the human rights framework only protects non-coercive actions that uphold equality. So um, so if 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 the, if the concern is that by having a monopoly on civic space by one organization, of course, that, that is a concern because that would in, invariably mean that uh, that, that uh, body will play an outsized role in society, which may be to the detriment of other members. And oftentimes when religious organizations, whatever the religious uh, uh, concern here, tend to be patriarchal and there can be quite, quite uh, often negative implications for for women and girls and even LGBT persons. So uh, engagement with these communities come in the human rights framework. And there's, a, there's an initiative uh, which I was part of in for, framing at the USHR called Faith for Rights. And what this does is, what this has done is, it brought together people of all faiths and none, including religious, act, religious leaders, to a room and asked all of them, invite all of them to look at their faith commitments or whatever their belief of faith commitment was, and from, the, from that standpoint, chart a course to the, to the universal human rights. In other words, the idea of human dignity, the idea of the golden rule, these are all embedded in almost all the faith traditions in, in, in the world. So the idea that we must respect everybody's dignity, we must respect that we, we should treat others in a way that we wouldn't want to be, we want to be treated by others as well. These become, if you like, tools through which we can all recognize um, a mutual interdependence and, and, and an area of dignity and diversity. So it's in this frame, I would engage with faith actors in, 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 with, the, with the intent and purpose of promoting, uh, pr promoting the human rights compliant ways of organize, or organizing. If there were concerns, and there frequently are, concerns about issues within, within an organization, such as coercion amongst members or, or discrimination, these are called out because that, that is not part of the human rights framework. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Shahid, for your response. Uh, we have received another question from another participant. And it says, the persecution, repression, and even physical damage to persons and properties of Catholics, Christian, and other religious denominations in Cuba by the Cuban government resembles the abuses committed by ISIS and other extremist groups in the Middle East and other parts of the world. Therefore, can and will the UN, your office, sanction or take specific punitive actions against the Cuban government? I think comparisons are always, you know, um, challenging. And mm -hmm. I think, um, uh, and, and rather than compare with a particular, um, you know, um, particularly egregious situation. Of course, the ISIS recent memory have been the worst lot in terms of abuses. But even if it didn't compare with them, you know, even on their own merit, the destruction of property, the detention of people, the other violations uh, that are there are quite serious. And perhaps it'd be wrong to describe that it has reached the ice level because we're talking about people being thrown from, you know, from tall buildings, they burnt, burnt alive. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not trying to minimize the, the, the suffering here, but I think more than the comparison, what's important is systematic, persistent, and unrelenting 
a violation of people's rights. When that is reached, yes, there must be sterner steps taken. And I, I would be supportive of more strict measures against people who violate people's rights in, 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 in Cuba. So the perpetrators of these violations are oftentimes um, you know, state agents and sometimes even non-state actors. They should be uh, identified and they should be you know, you know, a part of people who face some kind of sanction. This can be a travel ban on them, depending on the severity of the violation. But the first thing, of course, is to identify the perpetrator, document the violation, assess the severity, assess the pattern, and see if that fits a pattern, of, if you like, you know, of impunity and persistent violation that measures up to a, you know, a threshold of serious concern. Okay. okay, thank you. And we have another question here. It says, can you tell us more about what a fact-finding visit to Cuba would accomplish. Why is it important for someone in your position to be able to do this? Right, uh, it's a very important question. Uh, uh, a country visit, you know, happens like this. Uh, they have an agreement with the government receiving me, so Cuba would agree that they would facilitate a dialogue with me with government, government authorities, give me access to every place I want to go. So any government on place I want to go, they let me go. And they also, they also let me have time and a chance to meet unimpeded the people I want to talk to. So with the, with the first government collaboration, I should get a chance to hear directly from officials concerned about various measures that are in, that are in place, including say the attorney general, uh, the, the, ju the judges, the lo law lawmakers, uh, the interior ministry, p police officials, go to prisons, talk to, you know, and talk to prison uh, wardens, even talk to even inmates in, in, in prison, go to hospitals, hospitals, talk to administrators, talk to patients, talk to doctors and other professionals, go to schools, speak to the authorities, speak to you know, students. So being able to access all these places to gather information firsthand. Of course, these official visits may take place with state scrutiny. There could be an agent or somebody you know, coming around and making notes, this happens. But even with, even with that kind of observation, there is a chance to really engage with people. And of course, the key thing here is not so much getting unfiltered information with government dialogue, but being able to identify those actors in government who are most obstructive, but the most intransigent ones, to the ones who are perhaps slightly more, more open and to the ones who could be potential allies. So being able to disaggregate the government bureaucracy, different bits to know where the strength and weakness lie in terms of follow-up engagement. And then find some common ground for, 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 for dialogue because it cannot be in any government's interest to constantly violate rights because it only piles up the pressure for in the long run. It's, it's, it's like a, it, you know, it's a, it's a, pressure, a pressure cooker. It only has, it has to let out steam at some point. So it would be good for them to identify how they can get, walk out of that situation they're in. At the same time, being able to access unimpeded, you know, private citizens, rights defenders, witness what they have to show me. There could be even destroyed property. So if I visit, visit a church that's standing or in use or destroyed, I'm able to see a first-hand view of what's happening there and get a real, real good, a real nuanced sense of what is happening in, in the country, which you cannot do as well if you are doing it remotely or not coming to the country. Right. Of course, including visiting long distances to really appreciate the difficulties state may impose in terms of movement or, or other services is best appreciated by, by being there. I've been in a countries where Communities have been denied burial for those of the community in anywhere nearby and, 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 and have recommended place miles away. It will take you know, a long, long while to get there. The law of expense as well. So to really know these difficulties is important. And of course, visit prisons and see, and of course, test programs. Governments would say, you know, we've got programs to de-radicalize people. We've got programs to you know, educate people, vocational training programs, whichever. Unless you go and see this, you couldn't really know how effective they are. I also be interested in looking at school curriculum. Go to schools, look at the text textbooks, and see what is taught in schools. It's just for my own knowledge because sometimes these textbooks are very useful in conveying good information. Other times they can be propaganda tools. And to know how this is done, you know, is what the visit will do. So that's why visits are so important and mm -hmm. and 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 gives it a sort of information on that. And of course, any all countries try to clean up the act before the visit because they want to show a good space. And then after the visit, there'll be a press conference. Again, states try to put their best face for this as well. And then of course, there's another discussion in Geneva. And of course, there's more press uh, publicity as well. But throughout this exposure, states have a motivation and incentive to try to do better. And then of mm -hmm. course, 
there'll be recommendations made. And of course, I can follow up on the recommendations. And if states do not re respond to recommendations, the pressure piles up on them. And these are actually far more difficult to reject by the state than ones that I can uh, formulate without going to the country. Okay, we, the, the following is a related question. It says, is there value in other special reporters visiting Cuba? The situation of freedom of expression and assembly in Cuba is atrocious. And of course, in practice, these rights are often inseparable from religious freedom. So do you know if there are, have been conversations about visiting Cuba among the special reporters who are dedicated to these issues? Um, I've ha not had direct conversations with other reporters when coming to Cuba uh, because, uh, first of all, you know, they, they have to, we have to see if they're willing to have the first one in. And, um, and uh, I have had taken a, a bigger interest in Cuba than others, so I, I'm being in the forefront of trying to get into the country. And there has been no evidence that and the other reporters in this field would have an easier access than I would. Uh, and the only thing is I've had a long engagement with, with rights defenders and therefore better access in, in that sense. So if, if at the point where I have ruled out a visit uh, to Cuba, then I would certainly speak to my, my colleagues about them, them going. But when we thought going to, uh, to the country, after a point, you know, once we talk to you, maybe after the pandemic, we can look at how we engage with other reporters in giving more focus in their work to, 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 to Cuba. Even right now, all communications I issue are done in collaboration with other reporters. I hardly do one on my own. I talk to colleagues, get them to have buy-in on their part. So we put a joint, if you like, joint uh, pressure on the country through that. So other reporters like Association Assembly, as one, one reporter there, rights defenders and another reporter, uh, judges and, and lawyers, is all potential, uh, potential visitors, including of course the reporter on women's rights, the all potential visitors to the country and, and, and would benefit immensely from such a visit. Okay, we have, uh, I think we have time for one more question and it's, I think a good one because it talks about the follow-up. So what would you consider might be the next steps for Cuban activists and for the international community to advance religious freedom in Cuba? Okay, I think uh, as the year progresses, there are a number of opportunities. Like I said earlier at the beginning, the 1981 declarations anniversary is an important point to highlight uh, the, the concerns uh, that have been raised uh, you know, uh, about Cuba. The new US administration, again, offers, if you like, an opportunity to kind of re reorient uh, our approach towards working with US um, in, in Cuba. The US has an association, US led alliance called uh, Religious Freedom or Belief Alliance, some 35 members of the alliance. Another point of engagement to see if they can get them to do one of their deep dives on Cuba and therefore take Cuba's situation to the focus of, this, uh, of, of these countries and make them also join, jo join us in, 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 in airing concerns about Cuba. Of course, this beyond the US, US only one, one player here, but it will reinforce the US own concerns as expressed in the State Department's report. And of course, yourself report as well. So it will be building coalitions among states, building coalitions among, among society actors, and building coalitions across faith communities. This is the way to, I think, add value and add, add weight uh, to what we are doing in regard to putting pressure on Cuba. And again, the reaction from the government shows that these matter to them. That's why they are reacting so sharply, so harshly, which means we need to sustain this pressure, sustain this exposure, and keep calling out when, when violations do occur. Thank you. Well. Dr. Shahid, I think we have received an, an additional question. I think will, is worth uh, conversing, having a conversation on that with you. Right. And it, it is says it says that it is good that your office takes focus on documenting violations, but what about the Machiavellian laws and decrees of the Cuban government, such as social dangerousness and the law of association? which punish persons simply for suspicion of the possibility that they can do a crime in the future or a meeting in home with three other persons and things like that. Yes, um, these draconian laws uh, are also part of my focus. So I am now developing an analysis of these, these laws to highlight, call them out, and see if I can advocate for reform. So it's a very good question because not only should we be looking at the violations as, as incidents, but also as something systemic based upon legal frameworks and laws. And that's again, something 
I and my colleagues will monitor, will analyze, and have a dialogue with the government on trying to reform, re reforming them. Of course, because there are laws passed through parliament and other measures, it's up to the government to change them. But we would put pressure on them. And once we work uh, for a bit uh, on Cuba, and if there's no progress, then we probably branch out to engage other states in the conversation to see if they would also join in uh, in, 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 in advancing this. Of course, there are a number of re, uh, uh, states in the region who have strong protection and religious freedom, and they can be seen as natural allies in this process. So building up a coalition of states uh, to look at these laws would be another route forward. Well, thank you so much. I think we are like uh, enough with the, with the questions and we, especially because of the time that we have left and we'd just like to present uh, Dr. Babun for final comments if you want to say something to wrap up the first panel of the webinar. I'm not worthy to give any more comments. Dr. Shahid has just done an unbelievable job. I think we, uh, you know, we will, I'm, I'm sure, uh, tape, uh, have taped the, the program and we'll replay it and we need to replay it and replay it and listen carefully to the words of Ahmed Shahid uh, that he's given us the, today. Uh, they've been uh, unbelievable um, uh, um, information and uh, advice and uh, recommendations that he has provided uh, for us today that we uh, should heed as very, very critical to this process of seeking uh, uh, a stop of the uh, violation of freedom of religion and relief and the violations on human rights in Cuba. Just tremendous uh, information. What can I say? Except, Mari Carmen, I hope you give us, uh, give the audience the information on where they can listen to the program again. And, uh, and then, um, and, and also uh, a reminder that in response to the uh, information that we heard here today, in a few hours, we're going to have, unfortunately, it's not right away, but in a few hours, we are bringing some Cubans to respond specifically from Cuba and to talk about what you just heard today directly from like the horse's mouth, right? Hearing from the Cubans, this is, uh, they're taking a tremendous risk to be in public, but uh, we're going to hear independent, uh, from an independent journalist and a Cuban pastor uh, in a few, uh, at 2.30 at 2 this afternoon, uh, that we hope you will tune in again to the same link that you uh, tune in uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, and we will hear uh, and we will hear directly from the Cubans on what we uh, been talking about here uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Mari Carmen. Yes, thank you, Dr. Babun. I think we are uh, with the information, the slide that OA has the contact information. If you would like to have more information about. Uh, these topics of what uh, OA is doing and also the Office of the Special Rapporteur. And remember that this session is, and the whole webinar will be recorded in YouTube and you can find it later in OA's YouTube channel. And in case you want to watch it again or share it with others and you already seen the slide with information about the next session that will start at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. So it's just a while ago and a few minutes ago that more than in, you will be joining us with the same link. And we just would like to thank you for your attendance and we'll see you later with other panelists and other moderator that you see on the screen. So thank you so much for everybody for your attendance to this panel. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. Okay.